Welcome to County Road 189, the haunted stretch of road that runs right through the middle of Bearheart Nation. I am your host and co-pilot, Josh Bearheart Hawk. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about what makes a great horror story and why a bad ending can ruin an otherwise great story. So buckle in, keep your eyes on the road, and watch out for ghostly hitchhikers. All right, so over the course of my life, I have loved horror movies, horror stories, movies, television shows, anything horror, really. And when I was younger, it was a lot easier to find things that really creeped me out and scared me. And as I've gotten older and I've gotten more analytical and I watch shows from a different perspective, I don't get quite as scared. But I still, as a horror writer, will judge a story or a, a movie, a TV show, a story that I'm reading based a lot on how it ends. So while I might be sitting there watching the entire thing and not really getting scared, by the end of it, I'll decide whether I think it was a good movie or not, or a television show or whatever, based on how the end was. And there's a reason for that. And I don't think I'm the only one out there like that, because I've seen a lot of movie reviews that uh, t- tend to really focus on the end of the story. And I mentioned in last week's episode or last week or the week before, <laughs> whichever one I mentioned was Cloverfield. I think it was last week, so we were talking about monsters. And how the end of that movie, they showed the monster, and it kind of ruined the movie for a lot of people. And another one that really I think a lot of people would probably agree with me on, <laughs> probably for different reasons, uh, but that would be The Village. And if you haven't seen The Village, first of all, that movie's been out forever. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to be spoiling it, uh, basically the entire movie. So if you if you don't want it spoiled, go watch it, come back, and, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, you know, after you've gotten done seeing it. But uh, so the, the village was an M Night Shyamalan movie, and it's heavily made fun of, <laughs> mainly because the movie itself is great. Uh, at least in my opinion. Now everybody's got different opinions, I'm sure. But when, whenever you're looking at a movie or a television show, or a book, you have a premise, a beginning, and an end. And the premise for The Village is this uh, seemingly 1800s-style, no technology, people are kind of isolated, and it's just this creepy creepy area, this creepy vibe. There's these things around that keep everybody inside the the city or the town. So it's a, to me, it's a great premise. You know, you've got the monster that's kind of lurking in the woods. You don't know what's out there. And it just gives you this overall creepy vibe. And then, of course, you know that there's something else going on just because of how different people are talking and interacting. You're following the different stories of the different characters. So the premise was really, really good. The opening of the movie, the beginning, you know, when they introduce you to the village and the characters and all that kind of stuff was really good. And even as you go through the story... You know, there, there's it's not a perfect story. There's no perfect stories out there. But overall, it's a really good story. But then you get to the end. <laughs> and, and that's the part that I think blows it up for probably 95% of people that are watching it for the first time. And a lot of that comes back to, one, the monsters. Now, you they, they could have pulled it off if, if that was the only issue at the end. You know, that the the village elders were dressing up as the monsters to keep people scared. If that was the only thing, maybe you could work it out and explain it away. (laughs) But then there's the twist ending. And M. Night Shyamalan, he loves to do twist endings. I think a lot of horror writers, I love to do twist endings. You know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a good twist ending. Stephen King has done a ton of twist endings. He does a great job with twist endings. But M. Night Shyamalan, he kind of goes overboard trying too hard, I think. And The Village was a perfect example of that because you get to the the very end of it and the girl is going to get help. You know, she's unmasked the monster. She's killed one of them to figure out what what was going on with them. But then she hits what's a a wall. And she's like, what in the heck? And so she winds up climbing over this wall and coming out on the other side and finding a road with a police cruiser pulling up to her. And that's when it hits you that, oh, this is in the modern day. 
Now, I think the problem with that ending for me personally was the fact that like, okay, there, there's so much logistically wrong with this <laughs> that there would be an entire uh, generation basically that had grown up not knowing that they were in what's essentially an experiment. And so the, the end just, it just blew the whole movie out of the water. You know, I, I really enjoyed it the first time through until I got to that point. And I was like, what the heck was that? And there's a lot of movies out there that are like that. And I think some of it goes back to trying to horror writers that try to mimic each other and try to copy. You, you see greatness and you want to copy that greatness and you want to do something similar to that. And when horror, a trope in horror is having twist endings, things you don't expect. And that's kind of what makes some horror what it is. But then you have these writers that just take it too far. Now, the twist ending can be done really well, and <laughs> the the next thing I want to talk about in regards to endings was actually there's a little story behind this one, okay? So, back in the day, and I don't remember how long, it had to be five or ten years at least, I feel like, <laughs> but I, I had seen this, this show where the entire premise was this woman, she... Had, was leaving her husband and children. She had been, been having an affair. And so she was leaving them for this guy she had an affair with. And she's out in the, it's the middle of the night. She's driving and she winds up getting pulled over by a police officer. And then she winds up stopping at this um, this gas station. It's abandoned, abandoned looking gas station. And there's this this killer on the loose that winds up trying to kill her. I didn't remember all the details, but I knew she died and the killer had got her wallet and she winds up, she winds up at this diner. And then when she realizes that she's dead after multiple trips to this diner, she winds up going back to her house to find out her husband has been killed by this guy that had gotten her wallet and gone to her house. So it was all convoluted, but it was the, the, the ending on it. It stuck with me for years and I could not for the life of me remember what this story was when I was trying to, I was coming up with you know, the, the points for this podcast and I'm like, what was the name of that? And so I'm looking all over. I can't find it. I'm Googling everything I can think of. Finally, I just go to Reddit and <laughs> I used to spend a lot more time on Reddit. I, I don't as much anymore, but I, I went to Reddit and there is a subreddit where you can basically describe whatever show or book or TV series or whatever, or movie that you you remember, but you don't remember the name of it. Um, I, I think there's, I didn't write it down, but I think it's the uh, r slash tip of, tip of the tongue or something, something along those lines. And I posted this synopsis that I had, and I'm like, hey, can somebody help me out? And I got a bunch of different responses. And I even got one person that was like, you know what? I remember seeing this too, but I can't remember either, and it's driving me nuts. And <laughs> and then I went to bed because I was, I got, I sat there for two and a half hours, three hours, waiting for somebody to respond and. I was like starting to give up. And then this morning, <laughs> as I was getting ready to record this, I, I got up and I was looking through Reddit and somebody had responded and they had given me the title. And the title was, uh, it's, it's a show called Ghost Stories that I think aired in the 90s. And the episode was episode 15 and it was called All Night Diner. And it's an example of a great ending to a really good uh, if the ending had been any different, I don't think that the show would have been as memorable to me. The, it was so memorable because the ending where the woman is basically, you know, she finds out that she's dead. She goes home. And then the very ending, because I actually rewatched it as soon as I found out what it was. She winds up finding out that her kids were okay. Her husband's been killed. She goes back to the diner. And her husband is getting on this bus, and basically the bus takes people to the afterlife. I'm assuming it's heaven, just from the way that it's <laughs> the way it's set up. It's almost like you have to have died in a specific way to get on this bus to go there. And so she winds up showing up and trying to get on the bus because she sees her husband on the bus, and he's just giving her this look like, I can't believe you. And the bus leaves, and the waitress that was in the diner comes out and is like, Hey, you know, you don't get to go. Sorry, but you can come in and, you know, they the help wind the sign in the window and they take the help wind the sign out of the window. She's the new help at the diner. So it was, and the, the, the waitress actually had the same, had basically done the same thing. So I think there's, 
there's some extra meaning there. I didn't really dig too deep in, into it, <laughs> but I just thought I loved the ending. And that just kind of goes to show you how a memorable ending can be something that sticks with somebody for a long time, even after you forget the other details of the show, even after you forget the name who starred in it, you know, you, you can still remember that great ending to an otherwise maybe mediocre show or movie. And so <laughs> for me, when I'm writing, I strive to come up with the most memorable endings that I possibly can simply because if somebody will remember the ending, if they can get to the end of the video <laughs> and then they can remember the ending, that can be something that can really spark somebody's interest. If it's a bad ending, they might listen to that one story, hear the bad ending and walk away and never listen to another one of my stories. So I always try to make the ending as memorable and as, as I, I love going for twist endings, but I, I try to do them in my own way. You know, I, I, I obviously have influence from some of the other horror writers that I've read. You know, there's you know Stephen King, one of my favorite horror writers, <laughs> which I think there's probably a lot of people that can say that about Stephen King. But then there's influence from Edgar Allan Poe in there. I, I love a lot of his short stories and stuff like that. It was really an inspiration to me when I started writing short stories was like, I really want to aim for this kind of thing because the, they're so memorable, not just for the story, but for the way that they end. So now getting into my own stories, I've got three stories here that I want to share. And there are three stories that have kind of twist endings, but I really want to talk a lot about the, the stories themselves and what my intention was with the stories uh, in addition to the endings. So we're going to start out with this first one here. The first one's called I'm Still Here. And this story was actually written as part of a, a Twitter thread. <laughs> not not thread per se. It was I, I was trying to do something clever on Twitter and write a story. This is back before Elon Musk bought it. You know, this is <laughs> this was last year when Twitter was it was bad, but it wasn't bad, if you know what I mean. So I started writing this story and it was, you know, they're, they're 140 words or whatever, 200 words or less that they have on there. So it was just in chunks, but it never really went anywhere. Nobody ever really saw it. And so when I started kind of writing these stories for, to put on YouTube, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take this and turn this into an actual, one of my weekly stories. So <laughs> I pulled it from Twitter and I went about kind of adding things to it and changing it up. And I really wanted to focus, especially on the YouTube element, on the audio and on the, the audio experience. Because the premise is that this guy is dead and he's hearing everything going on around him. So with, with that little tidbit, we'll go ahead and I'll get the story started. We can listen to the story and then we'll talk about it after it's over. So here is, I'm still here. The last thing I remember, I was working the night shift when someone came in for a case of beer. He was a tall and rather lanky white guy with tattoos covering every inch of his exposed skin. As he wandered around the store, I noticed he kept glancing my way with a nervous look. After about five minutes, he approached the register, placing the case of beer on the counter and staring down at the register. Afraid to ask the guy for his ID and assuming he was well over 21, I put a date on the machine to approve the sale and glanced back at the man just as he pulled a gun out of the waist of his jeans. He ordered me to open the register and give him all the cash and he was looking back and forth between me and the gas pumps as if expecting to see someone out there. I opened the drawer and began pulling everything out my hands shaking so much I could barely hold it all. As I handed the cash across the counter, he looked back outside once again and panicked at the sight of a police patrol car pulling up to the pumps. Time itself seemed to slow to a crawl as he looked back at me, a scowl covering his face. He thought I had somehow alerted the police. Before I could tell him it wasn't me, that Officer Johnson came in here every night at this time, a loud popping noise stopped everything. I felt myself fall into the floor, but there was no pain. I must have just had an anxiety attack and collapsed at the sight of the gun. If I just breathed calmly, all would be better in a few short minutes. 
The last thing I saw before closing my eyes was Officer Johnson's face as he came to check on me as I drifted off to sleep. When I awoke, I could tell something wasn't right. I could hear people talking, but I couldn't move or open my eyes. It sounded like my wife's voice speaking to someone, discussing something that sounded serious, but I couldn't quite make out what they were saying. Then I heard her as she spoke to me directly. She said she loved me and would miss me. I wanted to say something back, to ask what was happening, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't even open my eyes. Then I heard a loud, long beep, and the room went silent. I thought that was it until I heard my wife sobbing. Then the voice of a man saying the time of death was 11.23 p.m. There was some shuffling around, and more than ever I was screaming inside. Why couldn't they hear me? They had to know I was still here. Then the sobbing voices faded. I heard a door close, and the room was completely silent once again. I have no idea how long I laid there. The silence was unbearable, and there was no light. Eventually, the door would open again, followed by footsteps and the sound of wheels. I could tell from the sound that I had been moved into another bed and was being wheeled somewhere. I couldn't feel anything. I could only guess, based on what I knew of hospitals, that I was being taken to the morgue. But I wasn't dead. How could this be happening? The sound of wheels stopped after a few minutes. There was an elevator and several doors before we finally reached the destination. Whoever had been pushing me walked away, and the last sound I heard for a while was the light switch flipping and the door being locked. When I did hear the door again, I assumed they had finally come for me. Maybe they would find a heartbeat. Classical music began playing, somewhat drowning out the sound of sawing noises that told me they were most likely performing an autopsy. I still couldn't feel anything, and for the first time, I was truly thankful for that. Focusing on the music, I tried to pretend I was anywhere other than a cold slab in the morgue being cut open. The coroner spoke to me as he worked, almost as if we were good friends. He talked about how sad it was that this had happened to me, and how he would make sure the evidence would go toward locking the man up for life. He mentioned that he had found something, which I assumed was the bullet when I heard the sound of metal clinking a few feet away. I had seen enough TV shows to imagine the process taking place. He was completing his inspection of my insides, documenting everything. When he finished up, he would work as a grotesque seamstress to put me back together. It was easy to imagine it happening to someone else, almost as if it wasn't real. When he was done, the music stopped, and I heard him say goodnight before leaving once more. It would be what I imagined was several hours before I would hear the door open again. This time, there were two men, discussing some kind of paperwork. As soon as one of the men was satisfied that everything was signed, I heard the sound of my body being moved again to a different bed and wheeled out of the room. The sound of a door slamming on what I assume was a hearse told me we were going somewhere new. The engine starting gave me a sinking feeling. I knew what the next step would be, and I wasn't ready. The ride felt a lot longer than I thought it would be. I wasn't sure which funeral home they were taking me to, but I did know what awaited me there. I heard the vehicle shut off and a door open, then close. Another door opened, this time closer, and I heard what had to be the stretcher I was on being moved. Then a voice not too far away asked whether that one was to be fixed up or burned. The man who had brought me in said there was going to be an open casket ceremony, followed by a cremation. The next several hours were filled with what I assume was preparation for the funeral. I don't know everything that happened, but I think they dressed and washed me, finally moving me to a coffin and wheeling me into a very quiet room. I knew it was probably a lot like the rooms that I had been in for other people's funerals over the years, mostly due to the deafening silence. I laid there for hours, what I imagined was overnight, as I awaited the funeral. For everything I had been through, this was probably the worst experience to that point. There's something about the lack of noise in a funeral home that always made my skin crawl. People could be crying their eyes out, and yet the silence still prevailed. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, I heard a door open. I could tell people were moving around, 
though who was there and what they were doing was lost on my ears. Then I heard sobbing as someone approached me. My wife stood there, crying for an eternity, as I lay helplessly listening. She must have leaned in close, because I heard her whisper that she loved me and that she would see me again someday. Then I felt a teardrop land on my forehead. For the first time in days, I could feel. The cool air on my skin and the wake of her tear rolling down my head was both refreshing and terrifying. I needed to get a message to her, to tell her I'm still here, to let her know that I wasn't going anywhere. I tried with all of my strength. Nothing happened. I couldn't move or speak or yell. I heard her walking away, her sobs fading as she moved. The hours crept by, with more people filing in to pay their respects. I heard the voice of my brother, promising to look out for the kids, my father telling me he was supposed to be the one being buried before me. As more and more people moved through, it was like living my life in fast forward. I never expected so many people to show up to my funeral. When the time for eulogies came, I heard familiar voices telling stories about my childhood and trouble I had gotten in and somehow escaped. For a brief moment, it all seemed so peaceful. Then it was over. The crowd left, my wife being the last to say one more time that she loved me, and the room was silent again. It wasn't long before I heard what I only assumed to be the funeral director cleaning up things around the area where I laid. The sound of the casket being moved was unmistakable this time, and I knew where they were taking me. The furnace room had an odd sound to it. Gas flowing through the pipes and pilot lights firing brought on a feeling of dread. I felt my body being lifted out of the casket and laid on a table. Then the realization hit me. When I decided to be cremated, I always assumed I would be completely dead and gone. My spirit, if I had one, would be wherever spirits go when the body stops working and I wouldn't be aware of what was happening. As I heard the shelf I was on being rolled into the oven and the door closing, I was screaming as loud as I could inside my head. The sound of the gas flowing was followed by the clicking of an igniter and finally the whoosh of flame as it engulfed me. Okay, so, like I said, <laughs> he's, guy's dead, he's listening to things, there's a lot of, lot going on in the story, and if you pay close attention, you know, I wanted the audio to really, to pop, and to really come out, and I, I, with headphones, it works better, I've, I've been trying to really cater my stories for headphones, especially because, you know, there's different things you can do with headphones that you can't necessarily do with other speakers, I assume car speakers will be fine too. I've been listening to these podcasts in my car and they all seem to sound pretty okay. Um, some of the stories I, I really should have done <laughs> maybe more remastering on, uh, but I, I've been trying to aim them towards car stereos where you have like the dual speakers or headphones, earbud, earbuds, that kind of thing. So, uh, but that, that I was really aiming towards that experience of, you know, you could close your eyes and listen to it and, Really put yourself in the shoes and think about what would happen if you died. And let's say that, <laughs> that there was something inside your your, your brain that's, that, that stayed on through the whole process. And you could just listen to everything going on. How scary would that be that then, to then wind up in a situation where you are being put into a kiln? You know, you decide to be cremated. And they're putting you in to be cremated. <laughs> and, and you're still conscious. And especially, I wanted to get that across with the, well, he could start to feel again, you know. And leave some of that mystery there. That's kind of the, the, the twist at the end there of, oh, his feelings starting to come back. And now he's going into the fire. Maybe he's not really completely dead. And that's why I kind of left it at the, you know, the fire goes and then that's it. Mostly because I wanted to leave it open to interpretation, which I do a lot with my stories because I like to see what people think in the comments. So <laughs> that was, so that was that one. Um, another one along the similar, not really similar line. Line, I guess it's it's a completely different story, but still focused on the end. And that is the next one coming up. Is, is the it's called the layer. 
And the inspiration for this story originally came from there is a popular subgenre of creepypastas online where people will write them from the perspective of I'm a park ranger, I'm some kind of authority figure or whatever that I've seen some shit. <laughs> and the, the, the type of a whole experience. And, and some of them have gone on and on and on. And they've had a ton of different experiences that they have put out there to extend their stories well beyond a single short story. And some of them can get really interesting. Some of them for a while they were going off of, there was this whole trope of uh, staircases in the woods, which <laughs> I think is still a thing. Uh, but the, the idea being like, what was, you know, I wanted to do a park ranger story, but in a different way, because I think it's kind of weird that like the idea of this park ranger is getting on Reddit because that's where most of these start, you know, park rangers getting on Reddit and typing up their story on Reddit. And some of them, they, they could do that. It's not out of the realm of possibility, but like to me, it would be more realistic that they would have some kind of an experience and have to fill out a report, which is where this comes from. <laughs> so I'll let you listen to that, and then we'll talk a little bit about that before we get into the, the third story. June 23rd, 2014, 2.33 p.m. Statement of Park Ranger Lance Billings. Location of incident redacted. The call came in at exactly 4.33 p.m missing child at campsite B11. All available personnel were asked to assist in the search. My partner Jason and I were among the first to arrive and were greeted by a frantic father who was begging us to find his daughter. The mother was in a near catatonic state and there were two other children sitting in the tent. Other units began to arrive, including search and rescue to coordinate ground units. We were split into small groups of four and given areas to search within a two mile radius, the furthest distance it was assumed the girl would be able to make it in the time given since her disappearance. We were provided with the description of the girl, being that she was four years old with blonde curls and brown eyes. She was approximately 36 inches tall and was last seen wearing a red dress with yellow flowers on it. She would answer to the name Lucy and was known to be timid around strangers. My group consisted of myself, Ranger Lance Billings, my partner, Ranger Jason Skye, and two civilian volunteers whose names I don't remember. We set off for our search area at approximately 6.45 p.m. with flashlights, flares, rope, and standard issue gear. Our search area was approximately one square mile of heavily forested land with uneven terrain and a cliff on the eastern edge. We covered this area in pairs, calling out for the girl and checking in every possible hiding place we could find. As night closed in, we returned to base camp with nothing to report. Myself and Ranger Sky were given a new search area and made our way to the zone to begin looking for any sign of the girl. Given the small area, we decided to split up and search on our own, keeping in touch via our two-way radios every 10 minutes. As I made my way along the western edge of the search area, I began to feel as if something was very wrong. I don't know how to explain it except to say the hair on my arms and neck was standing up and I was fairly certain I was being watched. I was calmly calling out to Lucy and on a couple of occasions, I thought I heard some movement not far from where I was. I radioed Ranger Sky to check in, and he reported he was also hearing sounds near his position, but he had not been able to locate the source either. Coming over the crest of a small hill, I noticed what looked like some kind of den about 30 yards in front of me at the bottom of a slope. Shining my light around the area, I called out to Lucy again and was met with silence at first. After about 15 seconds, I started walking toward the den, but stopped and ducked behind a bush when I saw something coming out of it. At first, I thought there was a large bear, though we don't normally have bears in this park. I kept my light on the animal as it slowly crept out, though it didn't seem to notice or acknowledge my presence. As more of it came into view, 
I could see it had a thick coat of dark brown fur. It walked on four legs, and it had a tail that looked like it was at least a meter long and covered in some kind of barbs. It was at this point that I got a good look at its face as it turned toward me. The eyes appeared to be solid white, and the snout was similar to something I have seen on dolphins. Large teeth protruded from both the bottom and top jaws, interlocking and giving it the appearance of some kind of claw. As I watched, it stood up on its hind legs, revealing the front paws to be more human-like than I expected. Its belly and chest were also like that of a man, with no hair at all. It looked as if it was going to come my way when a noise to its left caught its attention and it bolted off into the forest. Before I could react to this, the sound of crying caught my ear and I remembered why I was out there. I could tell the sound was coming from the den and I made my way over as quickly and quietly as I could. As I approached the hole, the smell of something rotting overwhelmed me and I nearly had to turn around. Looking inside, I could see what appeared to be a large number of bones and animal remains covering the ground. As I shined my light around, I saw a small mound in the back that was moving and I realized I had found Lucy. I crept into the den, telling the girl who I was and letting her know she would be okay. It took a few minutes to gain her trust, but I was able to bring her safely out and we made our way back to the base of operations with no further encounters with the animal. I tried to reach Ranger Sky over the radio multiple times as I made my way back, but he failed to respond. I could not take time to search for him at that moment as my priority was to get Lucy back to her family. Upon returning to the base, I was informed we had lost communication with three members of the search party in addition to Ranger Sky. I relayed what I had seen and gave the coordinates of the den, but the decision was made to refrain from further searchers until daylight. The search and rescue commander made a call to his commander and we were informed that a new unit would be arriving at daybreak to begin searching for the missing rescuers. At approximately 7 a.m., three large black armored personnel carriers arrived and 30 heavily armed soldiers dismounted. A commander from this unit debriefed me once more about what I saw and where I saw it and I watched the men head off in the direction of the den. After about two hours, the men returned, carrying the body of Ranger Sky on a stretcher. They loaded him up on one of their vehicles and reported that we would all need to evacuate due to a growing fire in the area. I inquired about the status of Ranger Sky and was told he was in need of immediate medical assistance. I was not allowed to see him and was escorted back to my post to collect my personal belongings before being taken home. The reported fire wiped out several hundred acres before being extinguished, and I was later informed the fire had been started by Ranger Sky as he tried to stay warm overnight following an injury that immobilized him. I was unable to ask Ranger Sky about this as he supposedly perished from his injuries in a medical facility on a nearby military installation. I have spoken to several people who were involved in the search and none of them seem to remember losing any rescuers other than Ranger Sky. Lucy's parents have publicly stated that their daughter was hiding in the roots of a tree and was found with no incident. They refused to even speak to me. I've been told that my position in the Forest Service is no longer needed and none of my old co-workers will even acknowledge that I worked there. I'm not sure what is going on, but I know what I saw. There's something out there and I'm going to prove it if it's the last thing I do. Final Evaluation Lance Billings is a threat to security and must be redlined. Permission to follow up, granted. Okay, so there's the twist ending on that one. <laughs> the, the, the idea being that it was the audio recording, obviously, for the YouTube video, I, wanted, I had to make it as an audio recording. That's what made the most sense. With the written version, I actually have it in different typeface, in different font, as if there was somebody like putting a note on the bottom of the report. And I thought that made kind of a, a more fun twist from, at least <laughs> as far as I was concerned, it made more sense that this ranger went through this stuff, filled out a report, 
is trying to tell people like there's something out here and the park service is covering up or the government agency is covering it up. And the way they're doing that is by redlining this guy, which could mean any number of things. My intention was they're going to, they're going to kill him. They're knocking him off, <laughs> but that it, you really could see it as either way. You could, maybe they're going to relocate him. Maybe they're going to, you know, they're going to throw him in jail or something. There's any number of things that it could be, but that was the fun of it was adding that, that little twist in there at the end, because without that, to me, it's just, it's another park ranger story, you know, and that's where I think adding that little thing in the end, you could listen to that or you could read that if you were familiar with the, with the, the genre and you could say, oh, well, this is a normal, just a park ranger story till you get to that point. And I think that's what kind of makes it fun or made it fun for me. Uh, the, the final story here, <laughs> there, there was a lot that went into this one. And it's kind of the same vein, the same kind of inspiration where this guy goes into the forest. And it was kind of the taken from the Missing 411 series, which if you're not familiar with that, just a real brief rundown. Missing 411, basically there's this guy who was a former police officer, I believe, and he wrote a bunch of books because he'd done a bunch of research on missing persons in national parks. And on the face of it, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is <laughs> that not only did this guy do this research and all this stuff, but he put these books out and he doesn't ever directly say what he thinks is happening to people in national parks, but he heavily implies it. And a lot of it goes back to, uh, I'll just say he was a Bigfoot researcher, <laughs> but he also leaves it open to other people to interpret, uh, not just Bigfoot, maybe it's aliens, maybe it's something else, you know, it's all bunk, realistically, people are going missing in national parks because there's millions of people that visit national parks every year. That's just the way it is. And some of those people are going to go missing. Some of them are going to be under weird circumstances because we don't really foresee all of the weird things that can happen, but people do go missing. And so I kind of wanted to play off of that as a trope, uh, as far as the missing 401 stuff. What if one of these people that went missing really did get eaten by a monster? <laughs> and so this is from the perspective of the person that's going, that, that went missing as if they found his journal after he'd gone missing uh not journal i guess it's more of a just written down on a piece of paper but we'll go ahead and play the story and then we'll talk more about it so this story is called finding peace as i climbed in the car i found i was still in shock 20 years of my life given to the company only to have it all come crashing down in a single afternoon because they felt my position had become redundant. They called me down to HR, offered me a severance and a thank you, and escorted me out. It all felt so surreal. Leaving the parking lot, I wondered what I would do next. I could probably find another job rather fast, but did I really want to? I had given up so many nights and weekends, lost the love of my life, and missed out on so much because of work. Maybe now was the time to live a little. I pondered my next move the entire drive home, thinking about all the possibilities. As I pulled into my driveway, one thought started working on me more than any other. When I was a kid, we used to go camping every summer in a national park. We usually tried to visit a new park each year, and I got to see most of them before I went off to college. We would hike the trails, sleep under the stars, and sing campfire songs as we roasted marshmallows. It was a feeling I missed more than anything, especially since work had kept me from the last camping trip before my dad died. Before I did anything else that evening, I started planning a trip in my head. I would need to buy most of the gear new, and I would need to find the perfect spot for a solo excursion. This was going to be my chance to reconnect with myself and decide what the next stage of my life would bring, so it had to be perfect. The next week was filled with online searching and visits to different stores to pick up gear. I found an easy to assemble tent that was just the right size, some super comfortable hiking boots, and a pack that would fit everything without weighing me down too much. As for location, 
I finally decided on the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. We had been there once when I was a teen, and there were a couple of trails that I wanted to revisit. It was early June, so the weather wouldn't be too much of an issue, and I set aside a couple of weeks to give myself plenty of time to sightsee and meander. Packing up the car, I set out early on a Monday morning, taking my time and stopping along the way to check out some of the more touristy spots on the drive. I spent that night in a hotel before finishing the journey on Tuesday morning. After a quick lunch, I set out for my first hike early in the afternoon in what turned out to be the perfect weather. The excitement of finally getting out and doing something for myself made the whole thing even better. Looking back, I should have known it wouldn't last. Tuesday night was the first night of camping. The tent was a little harder to set up than I expected, and a brief but heavy rainfall prevented me from starting a fire to cook on. Ready to just get the day over with, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of scratching outside the tent. Assuming it was a bear, I remained as still as I could and hoped it would give up when it couldn't reach the food tied high up in the tree. I felt it rub against the back of the tent at one point, and I could hear it breathing inches away. After what felt like an hour, it wandered off back to wherever it came from. The early sunrise on Wednesday wasn't as welcome as I had hoped it would be. I barely slept after the late night disturbance, and I was on the verge of ending the trip early. A nice cup of coffee and some powdered eggs over a fire helped my mood, and I decided to push on. I packed up camp and got back on the trail, ready to explore and see where the day would take me. Taking my time and only covering a couple of miles per hour, I soaked in all the sights and sounds the forest had to offer. I couldn't help but think that the first night was nothing more than a fluke, as the morning gave way to another beautiful afternoon. I spent the evening at an overlook, where I could see the sun setting through the trees as I set up camp. A nice warm dinner over a crackling fire was just what I needed to really strike the mood. This was what I had come out here for. The sound of crickets chirping and birds singing their last songs of the day helped me relax, and before long I was settling in for night two in the tent. I was just drifting off to sleep when I heard what had to be the same bear from the night before rummaging through my sight yet again. This time, I heard a tree branch snap as it tried to get at the food I had tied beyond its reach. It started growling and pacing around my tent as if trying to convince me to come out and get the food down. After an hour of pacing, it finally grunted and moved back off into the forest. I listened for it, thinking it might come back, but I was soon fast asleep. Thursday was a lot like Wednesday, except I was now thinking that the best course of action might be to leave the park and let a ranger know about the bear. It seemed to be getting more aggressive each night, and I was actually worried it might do more than just pace around the tent if I stayed out there. This thought was pushed to the back of my mind when I met a couple who had been out there since the prior week. They told me they had a similar experience the first couple of nights they were out, but the animal stopped bothering them when it realized it wasn't getting the food. With this reassurance, I decided to try one more night and see what happened. Hiking a few more miles, I set up camp near a small river where I thought that in the worst case, I would be safe from one side. As I ate dinner, the peace of the forest around me helped to keep my mind settled, but I couldn't help but think about how the previous night had started out as peaceful too. I tied my food up in a tree, tossing the rope over a branch that hung out over the river to add more deterrence for anything that wanted to try and get at it. With camp secure, I climbed into my tent and started to relax. The sounds of the night helped me drift off to sleep quicker than I expected, and I dreamed I was back home in my cozy bed. The light from the early morning sun on my tent woke me. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I started to feel some excitement as I realized the animal that had been visiting me had finally moved on. As I climbed out of my sleeping bag, I couldn't wait to get some breakfast and hit the trail again, but breakfast would have to wait. 
Unzipping my tent, I climbed out and realized right away that something was off. My bag of food was no longer hanging where I had left it, with the bag itself laying empty and neatly folded next to the fire ring. The food was nowhere to be seen. As I looked around, I found footprints in the mud next to the river. They weren't like any animal I had ever seen, almost like a cross between a bear and a human, with five distinct fingers and claw impressions that went out as far as the actual fingers. Placing my average-sized hand next to one of the prints, I found the print was much bigger. Then I realized there was more than one set of prints. The set I had been focusing on was the smaller of the two, but there was definitely more than one animal. Not only that, the tracks seemed to originate from the river, meaning whatever made them had come out of the water. I knew at that point that I had to get out of the forest as soon as possible. Packing up my remaining gear, I looked at the map and discovered I could cut through the forest and get back to the parking lot by lunch. Quietly thanking my dad for the wilderness survival knowledge he had crammed into me as a kid, I set off through the trees. I had only been hiking for about an hour when I realized that the sun had faded behind clouds. That by itself wouldn't have been too big of a deal, but the sound of distant thunder told me things were about to get rough. I wasn't ready for the rain, but it arrived within a few minutes, coming down in buckets. Knowing I couldn't keep going without getting lost, I was about to just sit down and wait it out when I saw a cabin about 30 feet ahead. Pushing through, I made it to the porch, finding the place to be abandoned. Assuming it was some off-season hunting cabin, I tried the door and found it was unlocked. I got inside and set my bag down, hoping the rain would pass soon and I could get out of there. As I took stock of the situation, I realized there was something on the far wall. It looked like newspaper clippings, though I wasn't sure until I got closer. Reading over the headlines, I noticed they were all about missing hikers. Some were from the previous few years, but there were others that dated back almost a century. Most were solo hikers, though there were a couple of duos and even one or two small groups. I thought for a second someone might be tracking some kind of conspiracy. Then I saw a handwritten note off to the side. Let's see if we can do better this year. Signed with a heart. I think the full realization of what I was looking at was lost on me at first, at least until I saw the picture hanging above the fireplace. The couple I had met just the day before was standing in the middle of the frame, the mountains behind them covered in snow. Something about the picture felt very wrong. Making my way to the door, I heard voices outside and decided to grab my bag and duck inside a closet just as someone entered the cabin. A crack between the door and the frame allowed me to get a glimpse of the man and woman as they walked through the room. I don't know where he went, I lost the scent in the rain, the man said. The first one of the year and you botched it, the woman replied. Just give me a few minutes to relax and we can get back out there. Even if we can't find him today, he can't hide from us tonight. The man was now sitting in a chair in the corner. There was nothing but silence for the next few minutes as the woman paced around the room, waiting on her partner to get back up. Once or twice, I thought she was going to open the closet door, but she must have just been fidgety. I was starting to feel claustrophobic when the man stood back up and headed for the door. He must have been waiting for the rain to let up. Even after I was sure they had both left, I waited in the closet for another half hour before slowly creeping out. I could see the sun had started shining again, coming through the windows of the cabin. Hoping they had left the area, I made my way back outside and started moving as fast as I could through the forest. I felt like I was being chased the whole way back to the parking lot, but I didn't stop or turn around to find out. The sight of my car made me jump for joy and I hurried to get inside. More than ready to get home, I put the key in the ignition and turned, only to find that it wouldn't start. So, that's how I got here, sitting in my car, afraid to get out and check under the hood, and waiting for night to fall. This trailhead isn't the most popular, and I'm afraid no one else will get here in time to help. My only hope is that someone will find this note and stop these psychopaths before anyone else gets hurt. I don't know what they are, but I can feel them watching me even as I write this.
Okay, so like I said, <laughs> it's based on the guy wrote, wrote all of this down before he went missing and it was found in his car afterwards. And to me, that was as far as I wanted to go with the missing 401 type of stuff because honestly, a lot of it is just, it, it, it sounds exaggerated, it sounds made up. You can tell a good story and you can come up with some really, really crazy things with just a little bit of imagination. I mean, all of these stories that I write, you, you would see them and you would say, well, obviously that's fiction. But there's things out there that have happened to people, people that survived and lived to tell the tale that are even crazier than some of the stuff that I've written in some of my stories. And that's one of the big things that why I, I, I don't really pay attention to the ideas behind a lot of the missing 401 stuff is because partially the guy that wrote the books leaves a lot of details out of a lot of the stories, especially the ones that he wants to be more mysterious than they actually are. But also because I've seen, there's a show on, it used to be on Netflix. Uh, I think I actually watched a couple episodes on YouTube. <laughs> they upload some of the episodes to YouTube called I Shouldn't Be Alive. And it follows different people who went through some kind of crazy experience out in the woods. They're out, not necessarily the woods, out in nature. And they wound up surviving when they shouldn't have. And the one that really stuck out to me was this guy that was a very experienced mountain climber, had hiked this area multiple times. And he goes out and he's walking along this trail. And it's at the top of like top area of a mountain, like a ridge. And he sees the spot that he's like, oh, you know, I haven't walked down there before. I'm going to go check that out. And he goes and he walks down this, this weird trail that he hasn't gone down before, winds up slipping and falling, and winds up like on this ledge on the side of the opposite side of the mountain where he was supposed to be. And after he'd been gone for a couple of days, and he, I, I believe he had broken his leg, uh, which was preventing him from really doing a whole lot at first. And after a couple of days... Somebody reported him missing, and they sent out search and rescue. And he could actually hear the helicopters on the opposite side of the mountain from where he was as they were flying around searching for him because they thought he was supposed to be in this one location. Now, had he not survived, maybe somebody would have found his remains who knows how many years later. And when they figured out who it was, they would have said, well, how did he wind up here? There's no way he got to this ledge on his own. But he wound up climbing out to a point where he could kind of get a good look at the sky and a helicopter that was flying around doing the search and rescue that just happened to decide to take a pass on this side of the mountain before they flew back for the day, saw him and wound up as he got rescued. And he was, so he was able to tell his story. And so the missing 401 stuff, I, I, most of that, while I'll use it for inspiration for a story like Finding Peace, I just, I, I can't stand it because it, it, if it was all fictional stories and it was being presented as fictional stories, that would be one thing, but it's real people <laughs> that are being exploited. Yes. You want the information out there. Yes. You want people looking and aware of these people that have gone missing, but you shouldn't be passing it off as if it's Bigfoot or aliens or any of that kind of stuff, you know, teach people that there are real dangers out there. You know, these stories that I write especially when it's something like the layer or finding peace, they're coming from one personal experience because I love hiking. I love getting out. And I often think about, you know, what would happen if I went missing, you know, <laughs> I, what if I was in the situation where I die out there and they find my body 20, 30 years from now, and they think it's something crazy that happened, you know, it's, it's stuff that goes through my mind, but it's also, I use the influence from these park ranger stories, like I said, or from the missing 411 stuff, because it, at the end of the day, you got to get your inspiration from somewhere. And when it comes down to it, that inspiration is what builds the premise of the stories. Going back to the beginning, <laughs> we talked about every story's got a premise, a beginning, and an ending. You got to build your premise based off of some kind of experience, some kind of, you have to have inspiration. That's where the premise comes from. Having a good beginning, you know, a strong beginning is, is what hooks readers in or listeners, people that are ingesting your story <laughs> you know you want to hook them in with a real good beginning but where it pays off is the end because while you can stumble through a, a not great beginning 
you know, there are people like I'll I'll go through a not great beginning just to see if it gets any better. You know, maybe the beginning is not so great, but the middle starts to get better. But the ending is what everybody remembers. The ending is the important part, the most important part, I would I would argue, of any horror story. Because that's what people are going to remember. That's what they're going to apply to the entire rest of the movie or TV show or book or whatever. They're going to, re- they're going to look at that ending and they're going to say, that was a great movie. Or, God, that movie sucked. All based on the ending. So, <laughs> that was kind of the point of the episode, what I wanted to get across. And, and I'm, I'm still working on figuring out, getting all of these down, getting a good length on them and everything. But I've got some good ideas, some things for episodes coming up. Right now, this is weekly. We're going to see if I can keep doing weekly. I've got some different ideas. I don't, I don't have enough stories to do three stories every week. So these first three episodes are probably going to be kind of an outlier, <laughs> at least in the short term, until I get some more stuff written. And I do want to write a few uh, stories just for this podcast. So that's something to keep an eye on, too. If you enjoy these short stories, you know, maybe you follow me on YouTube, maybe you don't. You'll get to hear the stories regardless. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll get to hear some stories down the road that won't show up on YouTube. So that's something to keep in mind. So make sure that uh, whatever you're listening on, <laughs> I've, I've finally got it out. This is on every everywhere now. I've got the podcast on all the different platforms. I've got it. I started on YouTube, and now it's everywhere. So whatever platform you happen to be listening on, make sure you're following the uh, follow the podcast here, so that you don't miss any new episodes. And if you want to support me, if you enjoy the, the kind of stuff that I do, and you want to help out, um, I do have a Patreon. So I, I have that linked in. The description of whatever platform you happen to be on, if that's something that uh, would interest you. There's a lot of cool stuff over there. But uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. Um, that's all I've got. I'm going to go ahead and head out. <laughs> but everybody have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.